as a physician, can I say something? I'm deeply worried about some of you in the audience who have your backs to me and are trying to look at the screen at the same time. There is a special medical condition called torticollis, which is when you have to go <coughs> So can I suggest that you actually turn your chairs right around so that I don't have to take some of you to the hospital in half an hour? Okay, so just please, you'll need it because this vision of the future will take less than 22 and a half minutes and we will go all the way around the entire world of petrochemicals and back. And I promise you, sir, unless you turn around your chair, you will miss three quarters of it. Thank you. The future is 50% lost in the first 15 seconds. Now that's tough. 15 seconds of answering the phone and a robot is not good enough. 15 seconds for a web page to load. 15 seconds for a credit card transaction to be accepted and all the rest. <laughs> I mean, you obviously thought it was funny, so what on earth is wrong with our country? I ask you, I mean, why is it that such a video would be taken off? I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> Did you know that your genetic code will work in a monkey? And your, <laughs> yours works in a centipede. <laughs> Did you know that you are 86% the same as an earthworm? And you are 93% the same as an orangutan? <laughs> That's okay. Who here has worked in a business environment in the past before you got into public services? Put your hands up and wave them around. Have a look around. You are harvesting a challenge in business. You know, I was in New York the other day, and I was in a huge, tall building of 55 stories and about one or two lifts. And you can imagine I got up a little late and I was already uh, rushing to get to the event, and uh, I was standing there. Six of us were standing there, actually, and uh, we sat there. Someone pressed the button. S someone else pressed the button. I, I, pressed, I, I confess to you, I pressed the button three times. Now, I know this is an embarrassing question, but I would, uh, in the atmosphere of this evening, I hope that you trust each other enough to tell me the truth. Please, it's very, very important for me to know this. Put your hands up if, like me, sometimes you have actually pressed a lift button more than once. Put your hands up. Now, now my friends, I mean, what were you doing? I mean, what was I at? You know and I know that Bill Gates himself cannot produce a lift any faster by punching buttons. Did you know that cucumber genes will work inside your brain perfectly? And did you know that all of your genetic code is written in the same language? Microsoft Basic. <laughs> I'll tell you why they're drifting out of business. Because they can't see the point. Put your hands up if that's the reason why you got out of business and got into public services. Put your hands up. If it's become something to do with purpose and making a difference, put your hands up now. And I, I went to uh, the US last week and I was talking to 850 airline pilots. I asked them, I said, Put your hands up if you talk to the lift. Okay, they all put their hands up. Now, let me ask you a question. Put your hands up if you talk uh, to your car or your computer. Or, are you too embarrassed now? But I can see that by your laughing. But you see, what happens is we behave irrationally. And we can cut and paste whatever we like. One slice of your genetic code into a cucumber and then add both of those bits into an oak tree and they'll work fine. Now, although you're laughing, that gives us the most staggering power. And what we begin to learn is that people behave irrationally, Patrick, under pressure. I'm interested in your view. How many do you think we will have? Will it still be 15 big ones, or will it be less? Put your hands up if you think it'll be significantly less than 15 big companies in the next 15 years. Uh, you will find the same is true of um, fund managers and airline pilots and accountants and IT digital communication specialists. All of us are the same. Why? Because the future of your business, my friends, is not about technology. It's not even about disruption. It's certainly not about innovation alone. But it is about a single word, and this word is perhaps the most important disruptive element in your future, and it is... And this is the miracle of life. You don't remember anything other than uh, just, just one thing. You remember something very important.
The miracle of life is that every organism on the whole world is written in the same code and 85% of all the genetic code inside every living creature, including every bacterium, every fungi, every yeast, is the same as in your body. Emotion. It is the reactions of people to your products. It is how they feel inside when they have had your service. Who here has had a discussion about getting a better balance between different parts of your life, and work, and other bits? And Okay, all of you have. Why? Because, of course, there's more to your life than life. Uh, it's about relationships and family, and work-life balance is now number one or number two career priority. Suppose, suppose you, was, you were to have a heart attack. Uh, sorry, what's your name? Tom. Tom. Suppose Tom, uh, heaven forbid, but suppose you were to have a heart attack, okay? We know now that if we were to take bone marrow cells from, from your bone, take a sample of your bone marrow, and we inject that bone marrow either into your vein or directly into the heart, that it is very likely that we will see an improvement in your clinical function of that heart. The extraordinary thing is that these bone marrow cells, bone for heaven's sake, bone marrow cells will find their way around uh, your body. They will be looking all the time for heart muscle that's been damaged. And if they find any, they will move into that damaged area of the heart and they will help that heart make a perfect repair. Let me ask another question. Who here in your job advertising says, come to Vale of Glamorgan Social Services for a better work-life balance? This is number one or number two career priority. It's one of the commonest reasons why people want out of business. They want to come to people who understand they're real people, whole people, that there is a family. They want to work for bosses who understand that if you've got one child at home with chicken pox and then the other goes down, uh, your childcare has fallen to bits at that point and actually you're going to need to stay home. Uh, and when you have a boss that understands that, your commitment goes up. Why? Because there's a passion to family. It's when your neck is fixed at an angle from your body and you've spent too long listening to a speaker over your back and then you have to come to a hospital and someone like me has to go <coughs> It is extremely painful, so can I suggest, sir, that you turn your chairs around because a lot is going to happen and otherwise you will be in hospital and you will miss it all. Thank you very much. And then they'll say things like, well, I'm living for the grandchild. Or, Sophie, my cat, needs me. And they'll stagger on to the age of 129, still looking after Sophie the cat. When Sophie the cat is gone, the passion to live can change. So we begin to understand something. You know what? Uh, if one, of the, one of the things that can cause death of spirit is when someone says, I don't think I make any difference to anyone else's life in any way whatsoever. You know that? Um, no. Did you, know, did you know this morning that part of your brain repaired itself? Did you know that your bone marrow is, has also capacity to regenerate brain tissue? How do I know this? I'll tell you how we know. You know, we, we, uh, uh, doctors discovered a woman who'd had uh, leukemia, so she'd had her bone marrow irradiated. And uh, she had cancer, and she was given some bone marrow from a guy who was a close match. But when she died, they cut up her head. Sorry about that. But they found that she had a male brain. They found male brain cells in her female head. And I want to ask you a question. You know, for Gary or for, or, for, or for Sue or for whoever you are, do the people in your teams really know that they're needed? Do they know that they really make a difference? And could they explain to their children or their friends exactly why it's so important that they do turn up tomorrow morning at nine? Whose world will really fall to bits if they don't get that report in? Why it really matters that this team actually delivers in the next three months? Do they really know? And you know, often I find that the people at the coalface do. The individual nurse who's struggling on a night shift with severe shortages of staff who's had two people fall out of bed in the last six hours simply because she didn't have enough staff to run around the ward. And there was various locum staff who didn't seem to understand what they were doing. Yes, she knows. But I often wonder whether the accountant in the hospital knows, or whether the cleaner really knows, or whether the, uh, the person who's doing the transport really knows. Now listen, my friends, how on earth did those get there? They got there from her bone. Why? Because her bone is constantly seeding cells into her head.
extraordinary. Now, we're rewriting all the medical books, I can tell you at the moment right now. And I've learned that actually you can touch one company, one big company, like Barclays Bank in South Africa, and suddenly you find 25,000 worlds change. And I'm still involved with the, asset, the AIDS charity about 30, 35% of my time. So that's a personal journey. And the reason why I say that is because it affects what I want to say to you now. I'd like you, in a moment, to put your hands in the air if in the last two or three years you've given time to things for nothing, not because it was in your job, nothing to do with the job, actually, but you just knew you wanted to. Um, you might have taken a tin for the tsunami disaster. You could have uh, helped out at your local school on the Parent Teachers Association. Maybe uh, you do the accounts of a small charitable trust, and maybe you help teach some children to read. Uh, maybe you visit... Um, an old lady next door who cannot do her own shopping and she cannot clear the snow in the winter. Uh, maybe whatever it is, but if you've done things for nothing, maybe you're part of a church as I am or a synagogue or a mosque, whatever it is, but if you've done things for nothing in the last two to three years, put your hands up now. And here we see passion. And you know what? You will learn more about each other on your tables in three minutes sharing why the hands went up or why they didn't. Because it may be that you're saying, well, right now, I have outsourced it. I pay other people to give their time, but right now I'm too busy because I've got three children at home, I'm doing a double career, my husband's got a busy career, whatever it is, but I'll do it in the future. Or I had a gap year when I was a student. I believe in it, but I can't do it now. But you saw the hands go up, and you will learn more in three minutes about each other from why the hands went up and from the story. You know, why is it that particular organization? Why is it breast cancer charity and you're a man? And you know what? Behind every hand, there is a personal story. And each of those stories is something that you will learn in three minutes. And you will learn more about Alex in that time than in three years working on the same team. Because that's where the passion is. You're going to find out something about Alex that he'll do when he retires. Maybe even where he'll leave a massive legacy after he's died. Uh, you'll find something about Alex that probably his kids are involved in. Um, something about Alex that, um, that has got a deep root somewhere. It'll be a personal story somewhere along the line about something that Alex is doing. And the average couple, my friends, in Wales is only having, a, well, about 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5 1 children. Well, you need to produce 2.3, 2.4 children per couple just to keep your population the same. And you're going to say to me, no, Patrick, you know nothing about Wales. Our population is growing. Yes, of course it is. And why? Because of immigration. You say, well, it's immigration from across the border. That's true. It's immigration, and it's happening very fast. And you're going to see a lot more of it. You're going to see immigration on a big scale from Eastern Europe, if you haven't already, in your, in your own part of Wales. I'll tell you why. In the last two years, over 650 to 700,000 people have come from Poland, Slovenia, Slovakia, and Croatia, places like that, into the UK. 600,000. The government officially planned, on your estimates, for 9,000, of which about 2,000 would come to Wales. So, in fact, there are 200,000 Poles now working in the UK. By the way, that figure I just gave you was officially registered. I'm not talking about people who haven't officially registered for work. I'm talking about, I'm just talking about the people who've officially registered. So we're talking about probably about a million new citizens just from the new European countries coming into the UK just in the, last three, in the last two years and the next 12 months. So I hope you're ready for that. That's why I'm saying the future is about demographics. We have to understand it. Um, and because, because we have this famine of babies, you see, the reason why we have an aging population in, in Wales is because uh, people have stopped making babies. If people had carried on making babies, we wouldn't have an aging population. If people were having four babies per family, there wouldn't be no aging challenge in Wales anywhere. Now, that's why you're going to see a lot of debate in Wales about encouraging people to have children over the next 10 years. Now, this graph is really interesting. Uh, on this line here is the UK average, and here is Wales as a whole, okay? Not so many differences. Yes, you're a bit older than the average, okay? Uh, you found it funny. So why was there such a big reaction? Remember, market research told us the truth, which is that everybody thought it was wonderful. You show it on TV, everybody thought it was awful, and it was taken off. Any ideas why? I don't know why. Any guesses? 
Reaction? Yeah, there was a big reaction. Any ideas why? Yes? People don't like being reminded of death. Yes, that means quite a lot to me as someone who's worked in the hospice movement a lot and with people dying of AIDS. That's true. Any other thoughts? I think that's really true. Someone has just lost someone. Yes, that's right. As every social worker would say, that would not pass my social work test for entertainment on a Sunday morning for nine-year-old children on their own just after burying their grandfather the previous day. Uh, what happened to grief counselling? Um, that's true. Um, and there's something else here about life speeding up, isn't there? Put your hands up if you notice that Christmas Day came round a whole week earlier last year than the week before. <laughs> you know, it's a strange thing, isn't there? There's a truism, if you like. And the problem is this. I'm seeing it even in public services, and that's a pity. You see, in public services, it's so obvious. If you're in a company, okay, what do you do? Well, you just make orange juice. Big deal. You know, one orange juice bottle looks a bit like another. But if you are in social services and you are protecting children and trying to make big decisions about whether a child should stay with their natural mum and dad or whether they should be taken into foster care and you're really concerned about the future of that child and you've got a case history, you've got adults that still send you Christmas cards and birthday cards and things because they were your, in your care and you saw them through. And they say, thank God you rescued me when you did, and thank God you then got me back with my mum. So I was only out for six months, but then you put us back together again. And that horrible judge, you told him to go and kick himself. And you put me back. And you saved me. And you made me what I am. And you believed in me, and you actually believed my mum could do it. And you gave her the help, and she did it. I tell you what, this is really important. And what I find sad is that morale can be very low in public services and those especially who are ministering and organizing can get so detached from the real passion of the work. And then we find morale is low, sickness goes up, turnover, uh, and everything starts to fall to bits. But you are the most incredible people, the things that you do to make a difference. And it should be so easy to get passion. And yet in practice, it's quite difficult. Let me say again, you will never generate passion by caring for an individual self. You can offer someone a pay rise, you won't create passion. You can offer them a stimulating job. Yes, you'll get an intellectual fascination. You may even get a commitment, but you won't get passion. True passion comes from something else, usually. I'm exaggerating a little bit to provoke us. But just hang in there. You see, if you look at happiness, and I know you've looked a little bit at some of this this week, what is the secret of finding happiness? Well, we can list all these things off, you know, um, to be in the middle range of income, not too much, not too little. <laughs> it's true, if you're in either extreme, it's correlated with depression. Uh, to have good friends, a stable marriage is correlated with, with, uh, with happiness, uh, to have a, spiritual faith, uh, a spirituality, a strong faith, to be reasonably outgoing, and uh, someone who tends to be slightly sunny by nature. Um, people who like their jobs, they live in a stable democracy, that's true, all of those things. But, you know what? As every GP will tell you, as every family doctor will tell you, one of the most effective ways um, for someone to find happiness is to feel that they found a cause. Who here knows someone who's been de profoundly depressed? Perhaps you've even wrestled with it yourself. And, you know, one of the most difficult things, you know, the GP or whoever it is that's trying to help them, you might be. Gee, you've got so many things to live from. And then they say, Chris, there's not a single person whose life is different because I'm still around. I think even their lives would be better off if I was dead. Wow. And this is death of the spirit, isn't it? And because a person becomes convinced they can't make a difference. Um, and what we begin to understand is that a key, a very powerful key to passion is helping someone to understand how they really do make a difference. And you know what? It's not enough to be loved. Chris could say, listen, I really love you. I will miss you every day. Do you know what? I will weep every day for years if you do, if you do something awful to yourself. And still they'll say, yes, but I don't really contribute anything to your life. I'm just a nuisance. I'm just in the way. So it's not enough to be loved. You have to know that you're needed. And this desire to be needed is fundamental to engaging with passion. 
Put your hands in the air if you've had a passionate conversation about what should be done about the war in Iraq in the last two years. Oh. Now, um, can I just ask, uh, do you know anyone who lives in Iraq? Uh, do you know anyone who lives anywhere near anybody else who lives in Iraq? I, I mean, it's nothing to do with us, is it? Why is it that we in this room are so stirred up about what happens in a faraway country to people we've never met and never will? It's irrational in a way. Mm? Oh, you've got family members over there. Okay, you have had. Well, you're unusual because most of the people here have no business to feel so passionate about it compared to you. And yet we do feel engaged. And that engagement is what I want to talk about. Because you might think that the people in your workplace, they're only really interested in themselves. They, it's difficult to get them to do anything more. And they're, yeah, they're interested in their families, but that's about it. But actually, you find these other passions, and they're very strong. So we'll begin to understand that there are four corners of the human heart, four circles of the human heart. That there are people who have self-interests. Yes, they're very, very powerful. And we're right to focus on them and to make people feel that they're satisf uh, satisfied in what they do, that they're challenged, that they're honored, appreciated, and respected. Uh, but we need to go beyond that and understand that actually people have huge passions for outside of life, outside of your life, outside of your strategic targets and your operational goals. Uh, they are passionate about their families, their relationships, their communities. They're passionate about Iraq, global warming, save the whale, whatever it is. And you know what? If you can start to touch these different areas of passion and bring them into the organization, you'll find yourself in a very different place as regards some leadership. So individuals talk about their needs, family, community, wider world. And making a difference, of course, is our fundamental slogan. And it really, really matters in public services and also in contractors who are providing services. Let me give you an example. Service Master is one of the largest cleaning contractors to hospitals and schools in America. And it does the worst job of all. It trains people to clean toilets. Big time. I mean, they have, you know, 500,000 people who clean toilets or whatever it is around the world. And it's a big job. And it's a job that most hospitals find very difficult to recruit for. You know how they've done it? What they do is they get a new employer, employee, and they sit them down, and they say, listen, Jerry, I want you to know, firstly, we're going to give you a great uniform, um, and we're going to give you great training. We want you to know that you are in the healthcare business, uh, that actually uh, what you're doing is the, you are one of the most important people in the hospital, uh, that you save lives every day. Every single day you save lives, and you do it by preventing cross-infection, preventing people from getting diarrhea, preventing them from getting multiple resistant staphylococcus, uh, you prevent them from getting uh, in complications in operations. More than that, you are a morale booster and you're a team builder. Because you know what? When people are ultimately stressed, they want to go and have a break, what do they do? They go, and have, they go to the toilet. And when they go on there, they just take one sniff and think, oh my word, and they get out as fast as their legs can carry them. But when you've done it, they walk in there and think, hey, oh, oh this is nice. And, they, and you know what? Before, the, before very long, you've got a team meeting going on in there. Because there's other people coming in, and they chat, and they talk. And when people come in and they see a place that's so clean they could eat scrambled egg off the floor, it raises their spirits, and they think, that's great. I'll tell you, you are the, also the biggest welcomer in the hospital, because the first thing that happens when an overstressed relative has had a very long journey and before they even go to the lift, the very first thing they do, the first point of contact, physical contact in the entire hospital is with the, <laughs> it's with the toilet seat which someone has left up or whatever it is. It's with your territory. It's your room. It's the biggest welcome reception in the whole hospital. And it's the place where, and, and people judge our entire institution by the state of this toilet. So you're in the healthcare business, you're in the morale building business, you're in the team building business, and what's more, I want you to know we really believe in you. We believe there's more to you than cleaning toilets. In fact, we're going to train you. We're going to put you through night school. We're going to give you leadership development. And our aim is to get you up or out. So we either get you into management training teams in the future, or we'll move you into another job with another organization. Because that's what we're about. Because we believe in you. And you can imagine they have very low turnover. In fact, their turnover is about half because they go 
in with a sense of self-esteem. They do the, the most disgusting jobs on their hands and knees that no one else wants to do. When they unplug block toilets and, and they take the chewing gum out, but they do it with a spring in their step because they know that they are one of the most important healthcare workers in the entire hospital. And in fact, if this is disgusting, people will literally die. And that helps them a lot. And so I'm saying that helping to connect with these wider passions is really, really important. You know, life's too short, my friends, to spend on projects that can't deliver because they're badly run. Uh, people who just won't change and projects without purpose. In fact, I'd say this. If you don't believe in the job that you're doing, if you don't think you can deliver on your targets because the place is crap, I'd say get out. Get out. Believe in yourself enough to say, hey, I'm walking. I'm out of here. Because I believe in myself enough to know I'm going to go and make a difference somewhere else. If I can't make a difference here, I'm going. And it's when you do that with a spring in a step and an act of self-confidence and a little bit of cheeky defiance, actually, those are the very people you want in an organization. And, you know, time after time after time, I found it's actually been the willingness that someone has had to walk as she's forced the change to happen. Because someone has had the guts and the integrity to say, this is it. This is the ground on which I stand. Uh, this is a meta-survey of 10 million people. It includes people in, in, in public health and, uh, and social services and things like that. So forgive that word businesses, okay? It's organizations. If people score on a 12-point score, go to Gallup and get this stuff. It's fantastic. It's 12 simple questions you ask people. As a result of 12 questions, you can score their engagement with your mission. And by the way, disengagement is easy to spot. Disengagement it says, I don't know why I still work for this organization. I should have left years ago. That's disengagement. Engagement is when someone's actually actively promoting the mission and the purpose and is passionate and enthusiastic about working for you. And those who are in the top half of engagement score compared to the others are 86% more likely to, to serve uh, their clients better, 70% more likely to have low staff turnover, 70% more likely to be highly productive, 44% more likely to actually meet their cost targets. Um, and uh, if you can do only small things, small things can raise your engagement score. You've only got to increase it by two or three percentage terms and you have a dramatic effect on the team. And you know, one of the things which is strongly linked to engagement strangely enough, is the answer to a single question, which is this. Do you have a close friend in the same team? If you don't, it's almost impossible for the person to experience engagement. That's what the survey shows. If you have a strong friend in the same team, the chances are much higher that the person will be engaged. Why is that? Well, it's because it's within the human being to do it together. DIY, do it yourself, that doesn't produce passion. But we are social creatures. We go for things together. We make things happen. So Mark and I say, we are going to go for this, and we're going to take Sarah and Judy with us, and let's try and get them together, and hopefully we can move the whole team. And together we're going to make this difference. And because I like Mark, take him out for a drink. He's my mate. Uh, he's been with me through good times and bad teams. I can trust him with my life. You know what? What we've done is we've created not a team now, we've created a people movement. And that's really exciting. People movements, what are they? You see... A team, well, the team's all very well. What it means is, sorry, what's your name? Caroline, is it? Paula. Paula can lead this team. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's great, but she won't change the world. Why not? Because a team is a team. And all of Paula's leadership is then just locked up to whether she can motivate you. But a people movement is something different. A people movement is worth through Paul's, Paula's friendship and her moral authority, her influence, her bubbly personality, her infectious values. She is actually changing the way that you're working. You're not even in the same hierarchical tree, but you know her. And, uh, and things are happening. It might be something as simple as Paula says, I can't stand gossip. I have a rule, no gossip. Nobody talks behind my back. Nobody, no, I talk behind, behind no one else's back unless I'm going to bring it with them in the next 24 hours. That is my rule. It's the rule as a team. You know what happens? A whole layer of conversation stops. As soon as Paula even walks, oh, mm -mm, conversation changes. And before you know where you are, it spreads around. Why? Because it's such a moral issue. It's just a straightforward question. So uh, we suddenly find that actually they've been acting about it. And, and Chris said one day in her team, you know what? I'm sorry, friends. I don't like gossip. What was that about? Well, I don't know, someone talked over coffee and Chris thought, well, that's right, I've thought that for years. It's about time someone said it, I'm going to say it. And so these values spread. 
Um, and people movements, this, can, uh, and this here's one with asset. Here's Thomas. He just grabbed a vision of how he could train volunteers in the Czech Republic and make a difference. And he's seen 640,000 people using a team of 30 volunteers in schools with a life-saving message. He's fr he sent a friend, Marek, into Russia. Russia uh, is, a, is a huge challenge for AIDS. Marek has trained 260 educators. Many of those have started to go into other countries themselves carrying a message. Led by Thomas? No. People movement. Tribal leadership. Because when you engage with passion, whole networks get motivated to change without you necessarily even having to have a change management program. Because you capture passion, something happens. It's extraordinary. Um, and here's another team in Ukraine. They got it from Marek. Marek got it from Thomas. Thomas got it from somewhere else. And he got it from me some years ago. You know, these things uh, crank on. Predator leadership, well, what's the answer? Well, yes, you've heard about trust. Hard to win, easy to lose. Yes, that's true, but, and you can say trust, well, how do you build it? You'd be truthful, reliable, upright, sincere, tough. All of those things, yes, builds trust, but trust is not enough. Why? I can trust you, but I just don't like where you're going. Sorry. You say, well, that's, that's your calling in life, but it's not mine. So I'm going to go this way. So trust doesn't produce, doesn't produce leadership on, 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 as of, of itself. I have to be convinced that where you're going is where I want to be. And when I'm convinced that's the right way to go, then I'll follow. So I can trust you totally as a person, but I have to be convinced that you're ahead. I have to be convinced that you know the route. And I have to be convinced that I want to get there too. Um, and, uh, you know, anyone can lead. Uh, a woman uh, in a cinema uh, who shouts, there's a huge fire, suddenly she's exercising leadership. You could have managing directors of the largest companies in the world and they will follow her at that moment. You do not need a change management program when the answer is clear, the direction is obvious. Change management programs are a waste of space unless people are convinced that it's for a better world. And when they are convinced it's a better world for them, for their families or the people they care for, and that can be a family team for us, our club, our tribe. When we're convinced it's best for the community, for our patients, for those we're trying to look after, for, those, for the older people in Vale of Glamorgan, when we're convinced it's been done in the right way, and on balance, when you look at all the pain and all the cost and all the benefit, it's the morally right thing to do. You know what? You don't need a change management program. You don't need extensive change management consultants. People will change. Martin could lead this whole team here. Martin could be intellectually unconvinced about this change of government policy. In fact, he's stonewalling, he's backpedaling, he's refusing to even put it on the agenda. But you know what? If all of you are so excited about it, you just think it's the most exciting reform that's come in, it's so obvious, it's a no-brainer, in fact, you've started doing it already. And even though it hasn't been agreed by Martin, hasn't even been discussed as a team, do you know Martin can't even stop the change from happening? Why? I'll tell you why. Because there's more to leadership than hierarchy. And what's happening, there's a people movement. There's a vision that's flowing around the organization, and you've got it. And Martin, well, he decided to work somewhere else. And that's fine. So we, we're learning something very important here. So the better way to change an organization is to persuade people that the end result will be worth the effort. When you actually do that, then change happens. Connect with passion. By the way, how to increase productivity by more than 50% and then I'll finish. Would you like to know that? Who would like to increase your productivity for no additional cost for, by 50%? Well, I'm, uh, who's heard of the 80-20 rule? Okay, well, some of you have and I, must, uh, I need to be out of here in about 20 seconds. Right. The 80-20 rule is the most important rule for effective leadership. When you've got the passion, you're leading with integrity, about things that you really feel passionately about, respecting those you work with, listening to them, encouraging them, affirming them, uh, and all of these things. And then there's the 80-20 rule. And the 80-20 rule says this, and it's a rule of business, but it's a rule of total life, that 80% of the, of the impact comes from 20% of all of your effort. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, in, in, in actually 10 minutes, 
you've probably got to 80% of the problems that need to be sorted out with this particular patient. The rest is over time, if you've got it. Um, in 10 minutes on the phone with a mum who's distraught about how we're going to manage the problem child at home, in 10 minutes on that phone, you may have helped to manage that problem and nurse it over for the next, uh, for the next day or two rather than having to bomb around and do, you know, journey there one hour, journey back one hour, two hours in the home. At, at the 80-20 rule tells you that 80% of the work is done by 20% of your team. When it comes to a new initiative, uh, the 80-20 rule tells you that 80% of the, your leadership impact comes from a fifth of what you do. See, well, how can that be? I tell you what, with mean, any of you, within five to 10 minutes, I could, but I could identify some 80-20s. So it might be for Margaret. It says, well, what's your 80-20? Margaret says, well, I guess I've got two or three people I really, really depend on a lot, but they're not quite up to speed, and I'm not able to give them real departmental responsibilities yet. So you know what your 80-20 is, which is probably the most effective hour of every week is the one hour you spend on a one-to-one -one basis with each of them. It's two hours a week. Mentoring, coaching, encouraging, equipping, supervising, delegating, and checking. And with clear accountability, oversight, and with one or two phone calls and a couple of emails, they're actually doing fine. And suddenly you've doubled your productivity, right? Because you've now got two full-time people working for you who are working flat out and doing really, really well. The most effective two hours you could possibly spend every week of your entire life. Uh, a friend of mine writes little notes of encouragement. How long does it take to write a note? 30 seconds. How long do you keep a note? Who here has got a note on your mantelpiece or on your desk and you've kept it for more than a month? A note of encouragement. How long does it take to write one? Two minutes. If you go to his office, what's the first thing you pick up when he's gone to get a cup of coffee? You read his notes, right? And you put them straight back so that he doesn't see you've read them, okay? He says, I'm just getting a cup of coffee. Thank God for that. You read them all, put them back. And as you read them all, you're encouraged. Why are you encouraged? This is crazy. Um, Richard spent 20 seconds writing a little note saying thank you for you really helped and that mentoring session was fantastic etc etc et and you're encouraged why because little things make a lot of difference that's the 80 20 rule find your 80 20 and do more of it is there something you could do in 4% of your time to generate up to 64% of your impact yes there is probably 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 so stop and think about what you're doing be ruthless about time stealers there in the 20 percent impact for 80 percent of the time be realistic about your goals cut out things which really don't matter reduce and shorten your meetings delegate in power like crazy use the dead time make sure you're online when you travel or whatever it is keep things moving on and appreciate each day and enjoy the moment and when you can add passion purpose and a sense of fun to the focus which comes through 80 20 then you really start to make things happen so let your passion show be the person that you were made to be. Have the courage of your own convictions. Be known as someone who stands for principle in your own leadership. Um, uh, focus on what's important to you. Decide to make the difference. And live as you want others to live. You know, example is the most important form of leadership that you can have. So we make, every, make sure that every target, it matters to you. If it doesn't matter to you, scrap it. <laughs> if it's someone else's target, forget it. It's got to matter to you if you're going to lead people, isn't it? It's no good inheriting someone else's target. If it doesn't matter to you, you need to go back and challenge the target, go all the way back up to the top and say, this target is crap. I can't implement it. That's what leadership is about. It's leading up. It's mentoring up. It's helping the administrators above you to get real with what's actually going on and the realities of the ground. And that's one of the problems in public services that often that doesn't happen. Um, so it matters to you, it inspires others, it's clear, realistic, it's agreed, it's reviewed, and it's rewarded. So your leadership example can last a very long time. It lasts many generations, in fact. So your team will always be loyal, so long as they're convinced that you're worth following, that your heart is in the right place, that your ideas are sound, your values are great, your friendship is important, the environment is fun, you listen well, treat people generously and fairly, with integrity and respect. And when they know there's no other job they would rather do or leader they would rather work for, you can change the world. My friends, if you can connect with all the passions that people have, understand where they're coming from, understand that they're whole people and they desire stimulation at work, yes, challenge and responsibility, but they really want to know how at the end of the day they make a difference. 
you can understand they have families and relationships, then they will follow you to the ends of the earth. That's the NGO lesson. That's the reason you give time for nothing. That's the frustration, isn't it? Most of the people here are giving time for nothing. They're not even managed. They're not in a change management program. They're not even paid. They just do it. And what I'm talking about is capturing just 2% of that passion and bringing that into your situation, which in public services should be so easy compared to business. And when we can do that, then the lesson of history is that people will follow you to the ends of the world. And what is more, they may will be willing to work for you for next to nothing. Thank you very much. How do you distinguish wise passion from mere enthusiasm? Um, I wouldn't bother. I think, I think the English have got a real hang-up about it. I think the Welsh are better. Um, I, I think that uh, the English have always had this, you know, very restrained... And then we go berserk on the football pitch because it has to come out somewhere. I think as Welsh, the Welsh culture has always been much more holistic, I think, in understanding this business of passion, purpose, and it's totally compatible with intellectual, uh, rational, logic, and all the rest of it. So for me, um, I mean, uh, you know, people say, yes, how do you, uh, you know, I don't like people who rant, or I, I, I get very upset by people who are too enthusiastic and too much passion puts me off. I say, well, go and get a life. Go and work for someone else. Because, listen, my friends, you know, listen, don't ever give a speech or give a talk unless you feel passionate about it. Life's too short, isn't it? If you don't feel passionate about it, it's not important. If it's not important to you, why the hell should it matter to anybody else? And it's the same with jobs. If you don't feel passionate about what you do, go and leave. Do everyone a favor. Go and find something else to do where you are passionate, where you get out of bed in the morning and say, I know why I'm alive. I know what I do. Uh, this is a very important issue. This team has to change, or the impact of getting this right will save a lot of lives, or it will change people's environment. Um, that, so that's my answer. I'd say, don't be afraid of passion. We've locked away passion for too long, um, and, uh, and, and, and look where we've got to. You get low morale. Morale is lack of passion. Low morale everywhere you look is lack of passion. Um, but where you have passion, then things happen. And it's impossible to make things happen without passion.